Inside Great Lake Sailing. My name is Greg Norman. We are fortunate uh, to have with us today probably one of the best match racing sailors in the world. Certainly the rules guru uh, of, of most of sailing. And, and Dave, I just, Dave Perry, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a variety of things. But uh, thanks for ta taking the time to, uh, to spend with us. And I, I think you can see in the background the, uh, your, home, yeah. your home club. Well played, but I spent a lot of time out there at Grosse Point and Bayview, and I've got a lot of friends out there. I've done a lot of sailing on the, the river and on the lake, and uh, I love it out there. And I've, I've worked with a lot of kids out there, too, and they're all great. So We have uh, two or three of our kids on our staff this summer that are uh, they've been to you some, a number of your uh, uh, you know conferences and different things, yeah. and they, they say to say hello. So I guess the easiest thing is maybe just give us a quick background. You started in Pequot and Long Island Sound. Maybe just give, kind of give us a little bit of a bio of your background. Yeah, I was fortunate to be born into uh, a family in Southport, Connecticut, which is, you're seeing on the picture there, it's a, it's a village in Fairfield, Connecticut, about an hour from New York City, right on Long Island Sound. It's a big sailing town. In fact, in the 1800s, it was a port between Boston and New York. It was a bustling merchant based you know city the, the green that you're looking at right behind you just picture that was all shops and stores and docks and you know those those buildings that you see right behind your head were the uh warehouses for the stores so um, it gentrified somewhere you know when the train started running the you know turn of the century into the 20th century and um so it's a nice village now, and my parents were, my father was a big sailor, so I was born right into sailing, and I've loved it ever since. And Pequot, uh, just like most yacht clubs, has a very active junior program. I had great sailing instructors growing up. Some of them are still friends. And uh, so it's just in my blood, in my culture, and I happen to love it. Highly decorated junior sailor. You went on to be an All-American at Yale, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, I, I did, yeah. From, from there, you just – you know, you, you got a, you got involved in a variety of racing, but I'm curious on your, would you say that your match racing is your best, is what you're probably well, as a sailor, well, well known for? Well, currently, but I would say, you know, growing up, uh, we sailed Blue Jays and Lightnings, which were the boats on the junior sailing side of things. And um, back then, uh, the, the beauty of it was that the instructors, who were all teenagers themselves in the early 20s, would take us would ask our parents if they could borrow our lightnings. They would, we'd go to regattas, regular regattas, and crew for them. So there was a lot of synergy between the adults and the kids back then, which is really missing right now. And it's, a, it's, it's one of the main reasons that, you know, we're, we're struggling a little bit to, to hang on to kids as they get older. So I was very fortunate at that. And uh, so I got known as a pretty good crew. And then I got to sail a lot of really good sailors, which is the silver bullet to get good in sport as you sail with better sailors. And then I was part of the first laser generation. The laser is a little 13-foot sailboat. You might be familiar with it. Yeah. It goes very fast. My first laser was number 931. Wow. And now they're up into the, you know, they're well into the six digits. And so um, I was part of the laser generation. I got to be number five in the world, so I was known for that. And then in college, I was very good in the short course racing and college sailing. We were national champions in 75 with my friend Peter Eisler and Steve Benjamin and our crews. And. So I was well-known for that then. So it's sort of – and then I tried the Olympics twice in the Soling, which is a three-person keelboat, uh, crewing in, in the uh, 80 trials for my friend Peter Eisler and the skip rain for the 84 games, and we came very close to getting there. So – and then I took 20 years off, and you know, then, I came, then I got back into match racing. So the match racing was a little bit of cross-training when we are doing our Olympic effort. We won one national championship then, and then – the other four came uh, since I came back into the sport in my 50s and early 60s. So more recently, that's what you know me for. But 
that's kind of my second life in the sport. I'm curious, what boat in your mind to you was the what taught you the most? What did you learn the most on? What what kind of boat? Every boat. Every okay. boat. We started in the Blue Jay, which is a mini lightning. Three kids in the boat, main jib and spinnaker. Boom. Now the kids are in opties, one person in the boat, boring, one sail. It's a square sail, sort of. Right. I mean, I'm not knocking the opti. I'm just saying it's a lot different than three kids in the boat with little bags of bazooka bubble gum and comic books and giving each other a hard time and climbing under the foredeck when it gets rough and having to put the spinnaker up and trim the jib. So I learned a lot about being with people at a young age. Sure. I learned a lot about the three sails, main jib and spinnaker, which are the sort of the three bread and butter sails, the lightning. And then the laser probably really taught me how to sail a boat the most. Very light, tippy, sensitive. So that's where I really got my sense of, uh, of speed. And then the soling, you had to work on the boat a little bit. So I learned about rig tune and whatnot from that class. Every class teaches me, has taught me something. We're working hard right now trying to figure out a, a middle boat from Optimus to 420s and trying to figure out what's the next step in an in intermediate boat to go from a, an Optimus to a part of its cost. But we're trying to figure out in this area what might be the jump because going from an Opti to a 420, it's a pretty good leap in terms of well, the, the structure. That's, the, that's where the club boats come in. And yeah. uh, most clubs have club-owned boats for that very reason. Um, and you can get club 420s. You don't need the fancy international 420. Right. Uh, which is just fine. So that's the main jib, spinnaker, and trapeze. Uh, you know, you put some Clorox bottles on the top, so if you capsize, you don't stick it in the mud, and 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 off you go. You know, there's. I don't think there's any one path, but a common path is opti to laser radial to laser full rig to college. You know, you haven't sailed with a single person yet. You haven't sailed with a jib or a spinnaker yet. So I'm a big believer in. in Diversity. I think kids should be exposed to lots of different things. I, I'm, I'm a, my whole youth sport premise is non-specialization. I'm a non-specialist supporter. Um, some people call it old school, but I would say we saw a big swing, as you know, in sports. You saw it in lacrosse, too. Somewhere in the mid-'80s, all of a sudden, there were youth teams and uniforms and coaches that didn't speak English. And I mean, that wasn't a knock on that. But, I mean, more, more professional coaches. And, uh, you know, twice a week practices and traveling all weekend. And, you know, the thing just got really, really, you know, formalized. And we were, a lot of kids were dropping out. And then um, we're starting to see the, the pendulum swing back even before the pandemic. I think people are realizing, you know, too much too soon is too much too soon. <laughs> and so, uh, anyways, that's a long way of saying I think it, it really doesn't matter what the kids say as long as it's something that's different and you know, get them on the big boats and get them on the boats with spinnakers and let them foil and, you know, as much you can give them diversity. You mentioned foiling with the America's Cup going to foiling and with boats like UFOs. Is that something clubs, if you were advising a club, is that something we should start to see kids get involved a little bit in with some of the, the foil stuff? Um, you know, most kids like to go fast. That was the attraction of the laser for me was going fast. So, um, sure. I think, you know, I watch Bora and Bear rip around at Bayview and have a ball out there. And it just looks like they're having so much fun. It's quite once windy and sail, you know, for the fun of it. Well, one of the things I'm new to junior sailing, I took over our program last year and I just kind of observed Macau's lacrosse coach. But one of the things I noticed is we spent 75% of our time racing and 25% of our time practicing. And it just, it, the model didn't make sense to me. So we decided to put in what essentially is called sandlot baseball. We want our fleet to be out as much as possible. So we would bring instructors in on the weekends. And if the kids just wanted to go sailing without instruction, just to, to get the boat in the water and spend more time. So our goal this year is to try to maybe increase our actual time on the water for the kids is maybe as much as 30% without, you know, every five seconds, somebody yelling to them in a megaphone to, to, to process so that they can learn to, work the boat themselves and do some of the things that, you know, make sense. Things you and I grew up on in other sports. That's exactly what I was alluding to is the overorganization of youth sports, I think is, has come with the cost and um, you, you don't, it's, it's hard to develop that real love of just going out in a boat or even grabbing a lacrosse stick and just with a couple of friends and throw it around and you know, that empowerment you get. Yeah. As adults, I think we forget that. And our focus is on skill acquisition. And, um, 
I think skills are important to enjoy anything, but you know, the love of something is, is the most important thing. And so was, was that philosophy grounded to you as being an athletic director for 21 years? No, it was in me. I brought it to my job. And okay. fortunately, I worked in a small private school, so I could really have a huge impact on the philosophy of the program. And I actually, uh, I followed a, um, a lacrosse coach who um, was, uh, uh, had a sort of a different view of, of what sports were. You know, he was all about sort of you know, hard tail and win-win. And, you know, I'd come through the whole Olympic program, which was really focused on performance. You know, don't focus on the outcome, just focus on the performance and get really good at what you're doing. The outcome will take care of itself. And I also believe that every kid should, you know, or have a right to is too strong a word, but every kid should have the opportunity to play organized sports. I mean, there's so much human growth that happens in organized sports that every kid should have that opportunity. And it's not about winning and losing. It's not about you know, I mean, every kid would say, I'd much rather play on a losing team and sit on the bench on a winning team. Yeah. What does that tell you? So, well, one of the questions I got to ask Gary Jobson, Gary had made a, I sat on the basket, I sat on the bench for his basketball team in high school. And I said, Did you learn anything from sitting on the bench? He said, Yeah. He said, You know, it was the one thing in my life that I wasn't really successful at. And he said, I had to, I had to learn that same conversation. And it's, 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 it's so true. I mean, it's just the, the nature of, of the sports. And I think multi-sport athletes are the kids that we recruit because they have a better understanding of a, of a, of a wider landscape of a competition. I think that's something that's really important. Yeah, specialization under the age of 16, it's just too soon. There's, a, there's an interesting – if you watch uh, HBO's um, Brian Cumble's show, they have changed the world of Winter Olympics in Norway. Norway won more Olympic medals than anybody else in the world uh, the last Olympics. And part of it was 10 years ago, they made a determination to change their approach to things. So they really backed off. And one of the things they asked the guy who came from America that took over their program, he says, what was the first thing you did? He says, I looked at the American model and did everything the opposite. And he says, now you've got these guys running around in all of the sports in, in Norway, and they're becoming a, a national and a world power because they don't have – it's even – they'll even find the coaches – if they put the local scores in their local papers, it's, it's, it's even gotten down to, to that level. So I, I get that part of it. Well, there's a huge, uh, there's many organizations out there for youth sports. Um, and many of them are come from the U S Olympic and Paralympic committee that are that the whole Norwegian uh, Nordic model is, is, is actually used now. And um, yeah, the pendulum is swinging. And I, I think this pandemic is really, you know, when the sociologists write their books in 10 years, I'm not sure we're going to return to the same furor, uh, the level of youth sport, um, you know, competitiveness and whatnot. We may, but you know, we may not. People might go, wow, this, you know, Betsy and I, my wife have a comment. We see more, more kids just riding their bikes around and, you know, shooting hoops in the backyard and playing with their parents. And there's a lot more of that than we've ever seen in this bizarre time we're in. So it's also cheaper, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which is, Part of that same discussion. I just a, a, a sort of a right hand question, right hand turn. Like I understand sailors for for Long Island and why they're so successful, but uh, I mentioned to you earlier that Long Island also produces a tax for lacrosse. Long Island is a very interesting. I mean, they have tons of athletes, don't they? I mean, it's a really cool place to grow up, but it seems like a, a hotbed for athletics. Is that fair? Well, so you have to do the geography. Um, the the coastline comes down from. Massachusetts, Cape Cod, and then it goes east-west where Connecticut is, and then it then New York is to the west, and then then Long Island sticks out. It parallels the east-west Connecticut shore about eight miles south, and then the island itself is about a hundred miles long and uh, 15, 20 miles wide. That's Long Island. I live in Connecticut, so I don't live on Long Island. Long Island is over there, right? Um, so I I can't. I can't tell you much about the the, the, uh, the, the you know, why they are the way they are, though I do know that um, you know there's a lot of a lot of the western end of Long Island and the western part of Connecticut, Fairfield County, is pretty affluent, similar to Gross Point. So um, there's a lot of uh, interest in doing you know good things for the kids and having organized sport programs for them. And but who knows why? lacrosse i mean and and probably 
it's like the Bell Parkway in hockey in, in Boston or, you know, there's certain areas where it gets in the culture for some reason and then it just feeds on itself. And the CW Post is probably a powerhouse in the cross, I'm guessing. I don't really know, but, you know. I just, just, I just find regional stuff. I just find it, I just find it interesting. Yeah, I mean, it feeds on itself. It's just, you yeah. Know, when when did the authoring when did the the writing come in when was that is that something that's it's been a lifelong passion because you've written a ton of books nah, um well i've got three books in my name and i've got many other manuals and then you know countless articles but uh, right. i've only actually written one book um the first book that got published was called winning in one designs and when i was uh, training for the olympics and trying for the olympics in the 70s uh, a friend of mine in major hall was the editor of sailing world magazine Back then, it was called Yacht Racing, Yacht Racing Magazine, then became Yacht Racing Cruising Magazine. But it's always been the, the standard um, you know, racing magazine, sets the bar. And he asked me, and I was doing a lot of clinics, back to my coaching. I was, that's how I was raising money for an Olympic effort, is we'd go to Texas for regatta, so I'd organize a clinic before and after. And, uh, and my teaching was going well, and it turned out I, I was able to clearly explain things, and and I, I kind of, that was my trade. So Major asked me to write a column every month called Winning in One Designs for the magazine. So I did that for four years, 10 issues a year. So that was 40 of them. At the end of it, my friends were like, Dave, you know, we're tired of trying to find that old piece of paper we cut out. Can you just put them in a book? So my first book was a compilation. Winning in One Designs is just those 40 columns that I wrote uh, as individual columns. And then I tried for the Olympics in 1984, didn't quite make it. So I had the summer off. So that's when I wrote the book, Understand the Racing Rules of Sailing, which is something I'd always wanted to do. And I, I finally had the time to do it. So that, that book I wrote. And every four years, they changed the rules. So I get to republish that book every four years. And then in the 90s, I did a rules quiz for, it was called, well, now it's called U.S. Sailing. Back then, it was USYRU, U.S. Scott Racing Union. And every month for 10 months, I would do a quiz for 10 years. There's 100 of them. So my third book is Dave Perry's 100 Best Racing Rules Quizzes, which really shows those quizzes in a compilation. So um, I've taken pieces, bits and pieces and put them together in books because it was, it's great information and it gets, sure. you know, it's helpful to people. And then I wrote the book on the rules. And uh, this is an extension of my teaching. Okay. So just something you enjoy, you know, because part of that's – you're currently the chairman of the U.S. Sailing Appeals Committee. Am I correct? I am. Is there, was there something in the background that decided that rules was a, a part of something you wanted to be a, sort of an expert on? Um, well, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, you you have some hobbies, you have some things you're interested in. So to try and trace back the etymology of how you got there. Um, my dad was a big sailboat racer and he was a banker and he had that kind of mind and he loved the rules. So sitting around the dinner table, literally when I was 10, 11 years old, just getting into sport, he kind of took it on himself to teach me the rules and literally get the knives and fork. And the, my mom would always say, you know, she knew dinner was over when the knife was the boat on starboard and the fork was the boat on port. <laughs> <laughs> and so there, dinner was over and clear the deck. Here comes the, the rules. Yeah. And so I loved it. I loved, I loved the, that. I loved the connection with my dad. You know, we all love doing something with our parent. Sure. Um, but I also, uh, I'm a puzzle player. I enjoy doing puzzles. So I enjoyed the trying to make, you know, something clear out of something that seems kind of not clear. And then um, he gave me his appeals book. Appeals are just protests that get appealed to the higher, you know, like the Supreme Court. And then they publish their decision. So he gave me his copy of the appeals book when I wanted to Deerfield. Right. And I used to read it. Like every night I'd have it on my bedside table. I'd read an appeal. It would be, Here's the situation. And there's a drawing. I close it, think about it, what I think the answer is. And then I'd read it. I go, oh, got that one right, got that one wrong. I read the whole appeals book. I'm probably the only kid in the world that's ever read the appeals book for pleasure in high school. It's kind of foreshadowing. And then when I got to college, it turns out that short course racing, where the boats are always within a foot or two, if you know the rules clearly, you can be pretty much of an assassin. So I never use them to throw, I never use them to protest or whatnot. I just use them to play the game better. But I got really, sharp out of it. I studied them a lot. And uh, that's one reason we became national champion and two-time All-American is because uh, my rules knowledge. And then it just goes from there. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's all of the knowledge you bring from everything else to come back to it. When I had a chance to talk to Peter Eisler, your, you know, former, well, current friend and former teammate, 
Peter lived down the street from me in San Diego, and I didn't know until I interviewed him that he had a meteorologic a meteorological degree. Yeah. And he never, and he was really clear. He said he would never mention the, the, the degree because it was always, he said it might only have been a 1% step up. He said he didn't really know why he got the degree, and he said he, but he used it when he ended up, you know, big boat sailing. Yeah. And it's, it's, that, it's that small advantages that, you know, you take advantage to. Now, yeah. understanding the rules, the racing rules of sailing 2020, you can pick that up, I think, at ussailing.com, I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, US Sailing is a publisher for the books. I think it might be ussailing.org. But you can just Google U.S. Sailing and then just go to their, their store, their shop, and they have uh, – it's all discounted now. And people say, oh, Dave, why would I buy a book on the rules now and the rules are going to change in January 1st because they're going to change every four years they change. My answer is the racing rules are not going to change. Um, they've made a really big effort since 1997 not to change the racing rules. So Starburst is still going to right away. Lure is still going to right away. Mark Room is still going to be Mark Room. So, you know, people could easily go sailing next year – without reading the new rules and, and, and there'd be no difference. So I encourage people to grab it now. It's a good discount and you can get it from there. You're um, also doing a, a webinar with, uh, let me get the right name. I think it's, it, if I say it right, it's, I know it's Dave Dallenbach. Yeah, Dave Dallenbach. Uh, and he he is, and I, mm-hmm. You guys are doing a webinar on, on I believe, uh, you started, is it on Sundays? Yeah, we call it the Daves. Uh, Dave is on the Racing Rules Committee. He and I grew up together in, in the same hometown, played Little League baseball together and sailed the Pequot right behind your head there. And uh, so it's a, it's a four-series webinar. It started last Sunday. He talked about Rule 10. This Sunday, I'm going to talk about Rule 14, which is avoiding contact. Then next Sunday, he's going to talk about Rule 16, which is changing course when you're luffing and attacking the other boat. Right. And then on June 28th, I talk about Rule 17, which is all the proper course. And it's uh, 7 o'clock on Sundays. David's website is called Speed and Smarts, just Speed and Smarts. You just Google Speed and Smarts. You go right to his website. You can sign up for the webinar there. He has a whole online um, learning the racing rules tool called Learn the Rules 2020. And it's an online interactive learn the rules. He also has his uh, newsletter called Speed and Smarts. So if people are interested, and if you miss a session, the, the fee is 55 bucks for all four of them. But if you miss one, Dave will send the recording and the transcript from the chat room. So, you know, you can listen to it anytime. Now, Sunday's upcoming webinar is on avoiding contact. Is that not, does that really need to be a rule? <laughs> <laughs> do you know that uh, basketball, by rule, is a non-contact sport? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Not As lacrosse. Basketball. Lacrosse is a contact sport. No, I, I get that. And I, and I, I'm, I referee basketball. So I, 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 get, I get your point. But crashing into a body is <laughs> crashing into boats. I mean, there's a bit of a difference there. Well, and there's, there's crashes and there's crashes. And, and, uh, so, but yeah, it's a rule. Um, and it's got a lot of nuance to it. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're the right-of-way boat and you hit another boat, you break the rule, but they can't throw you out unless you do some damage or injury. Right. And those are subjective words. So, you know, so they're, they're acknowledging that there, you know, there is, you know, Rubbin's racing to some degree, though we all try to avoid it, but you can have side to side contact doesn't really affect anything. And then the right away boat won't get thrown out for that. But if they do any damage to them or the other boat, then they can get thrown out because we don't want boats crashing into each other. It's the boats are expensive and it's not safe. And so there is, there's rules around it and I'm going to get into it. When you talk about national guys racing at the national level, or guys that do the Mac and all those guys, the, the rules, those guys are pretty, uh, uh, you know, they understand the rules pretty well. I do a Monday hand, I do a Monday double handed with just a, you know, a fun beer league kind of thing, which is yep. what we do in San Diego. Yep. Where do you get more complaints from, the beer league guys or the guys at the top? Complaints about what? Rules in general. <laughs> I mean, what do you see? Is, is, is there, is beer, there something- beer can racing is sort of there's an unwritten rule, which is, you know, we don't worry too much about the rules. We're having fun. Let's not hit each other. And, right. so, you know, the people that are, you know, the, the rules become more important when the outcome of the race becomes more important. Right. And or when the quality of the racing, like college sailors, you know, they like it to be a good, hard sport. So, you know, they like it when people sail by the rules, not. They don't try to throw people out, but they also get a little disappointed if somebody cuts the corner and just ignores a rule because it just, it just lessens the quality of the experience and lessens the quality of the game. It'd be like playing chess with somebody, but they kept moving their pawn five places, you know, and you're looking at you like, you know, what, you know, what's a big deal? Well, it's not a big deal if you're just kids 
hacking around on a chessboard, but it is a big deal if you're trying to actually play the game of chess correctly. What do you think the, mis the most misconstrued rule is in your mind for sailing? It, it, maybe that's not even a, a good question, but I'm just curious. Well, I think of basketball, I think of travel. Yeah. And traveling is such a, you know, subjective discussion. Baseball is, is, an, is another sport that, you know, if it's 10 to nothing and the pitch isn't over the kid's head, it's a strike to get, a, you know, to move the baseball game along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair questions. The um, sailing, of course, doesn't have referees. So there is no strike zone, per se, that you have to deal with. So, right. it's, um, so there's, you know, there's often arguments about what actually happened. You know, something could happen, and you could ask five different people who were involved what happened, and they can give you different variations, you know. He was wearing a blue shirt. No, he was wearing a yellow shirt. No, he was on port. So that's one of the – whenever there's a protest, there's always two elements. One is, you know, trying to figure out what happened, and people have different stories. That's the hard part. The other one is everybody agrees on what happened, but they don't agree on the application of the rules. And for that, in Rule 16, which Dave's going to talk about next week, is when the right-of-way boat changes course. Is you actually can interfere with the other boat, just like other sports. There's all kinds of rules. Like in basketball, you have to be set, uh, you know, three feet away or whatever it is. You know, there's all kinds of rules about in motion. So Rule 16 is a tricky one because the boats are in motion. And then I'd say, um, you know, around the marks, people are the, the rules are pretty technical and people aren't they don't like catch all the nuances so there's usually a lot of shouting and and bumping at the marks last year when we started to race we've been cruisers but we're getting involved in racing and you know it's the crazy it's going to sound you pick up u.s sailings 101 which is the bible we use for junior sailing we've picked up a couple of the, the rule books from u.s sailing as well surprisingly for an intermediate sailor uh at the racing level if you read the books and follow through and, and do some of the, some of the work that's involved in it, I think it also helps your sailing because you just understand it better. And I think that's something that gets lost in translation. Well, like in any sport, there's uh, the, every national governing body of a sport has an educational program. They've got training programs. They've got manuals and U S sailing is no exception. And I've been involved in the education side for a long time and they do a great job. And just like you say, they've got all kinds of, books and workbooks and, you know, materials for people to learn how to sail, to learn how to race, to learn how to teach people to learn how to sail, learn how to race. Uh, they have a handy guide to the rules, which is just basically a simplified version of the rules. It's just, um, you know, it's a few pages with some fun drawings. And I always encourage people to get that first. Don't pick up the rule book first because you're going to, you know, you're going to get overwhelmed. But uh, the handy guide to the rules is a good thing. So, I agree with you. U.S. sailing is a good place to turn to for good materials. Sometimes when you're involved in the business of sailing or in the business of any recreation, you don't do it as much because you're in the business of it as maybe a recreational person who's a doctor comes out to sail. How much, how often do you get out to sail now? Now, now, or? Now, in, in summers, <laughs> in just typical, typical, weather, typical weather. So I sail with my wife, Betsy, and uh, every Wednesday night we have racing at our club. In fact, um, Right behind you somewhere, the boats that we race in, uh, I, I can't tell how old that picture is, but uh, um, that's an older picture, so they're not okay. there. Anyway, okay. Um, and notice over your left shoulder is the golf course. I don't spend any time, any yeah. time there. So, but I try to sail, you know, once a week with bets, which is great, on uh, Wednesday afternoon. And then I try to put on my calendar, you know, I try and give myself three to five regattas every year of team racing or match racing, some fun things to do, just it's really fun to do and you know but it's expensive so i have to i have to balance that with work <laughs> our uh, our junior staff we've got a couple of brothers um the walls brothers who are going to try to qualify for the 2024 olympics on a 49er okay and they're getting a uh, i guess a practice boat from the olympic committee to as part of that process Great. but they asked me to ask you and i said this before we, we talked a little bit before the interview about uching yeah and they were just, they asked you sort of your definition of what you thought, and, and they thought that that might be the most uh, misconstrued rule in the books. And I, so I thought I'd, I'd ask the expert if that makes any sense. Well, um, first of all, uh, if you want to experience ooching, just um, keep your, keep your, put your hands on your lap and now move your chair to the right. Just do it. Okay. Did that. That's ooching. So you kind of okay. scooch your body. And if you do that on a boat, you can impart kinetic energy into the boat. Right. And actually make it go a little faster. 
and is um, they're trying so hard to keep the sport a sailboat race and not a kinetics race or a rowing race. And right. it's, it's hard in the smaller boats because all that stuff is so powerful. So um, the rules uh, define uching as a sudden forward body movement stopped abruptly. A sudden forward body movement stopped abruptly is how uching is described. And that is illegal. You can't do that. You can't suddenly move your body forward. Like, for instance, the crew, you're about to go on a wave. The crew can't run up and hit the mast. You can't run forward and then stop abruptly because that's going to impart kinetic energy and make the boat go faster. So that's illegal. Whether it makes the boat go faster or not, that action is illegal. Uh, except for college racing. College racing decided that was kind of fun. And they don't use spinnakers and trapezes, and they thought it might be fun for the crews to do it. So in college racing, you're allowed to ooch. Um, and you can do it sort of once per wave you know, to, to get the boat going. But then what's interesting is that a lot of classes have trouble policing it. So in some classes like the 420, 470 class, which is Olympic class, or maybe the 49er, I can't remember, but uh, the race when you can put a flag up, which means anything goes. So after over eight knots or nine knots, up goes the, the flag, and now you can ooch and pump and, and rock all you want. Okay. So you'll actually see people on the trapeze. They're literally ooching and rocking and pumping their bodies. Um, it's a whole different thing. So um, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm not sure that the rules misunderstood. It's just that certain if somebody sails college and they go back into regular racing, they got to remember, oh, I can't do it in regular racing. Or when they get to college, oh, I can do that. Now I can do that. So cool. Anyways. Well, listen, I really appreciate the conversation. Um, I think it's, uh, we want to make sure that everybody picks up uh, the, the seminar, the webinar you guys are doing on the Sundays. Yeah. I'll put that information up at the end of the, uh, end of the show. Appreciate it. Dave, it's really a, an honor to have a chance to talk to you, and, and it's just been fun being able to. One of the things I've done in Detroit here is that we've had some really – the, the sailing world here has got some really qualified and some really terrific sailors. I sure do. And as you talk to – um, as you get into it a little bit more, you realize, and sometimes I don't even think the people here realize, you know, fresh water is always the, the plus side to things, certainly, versus salt. Having lived in San Diego for a long time, I can tell you that's true. But it's just been fun being able to do this series because it's just the love of the sport and, and everybody shares it. And that's something, I think that's something that's really important. Well, like I said, there's so much great sailing out there and there's so much great, uh, you know, interest in doing a great thing for the kids and, and making the sport fun. So, I'm a big fan of that area out there. And thanks for the time on uh, with you. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Dave, you have a great rest of the summer and uh, be safe. And we will see you real soon again. Thank you okay. so much for the time.